Women's light welterweight Pierce O'Leary also reached the quarterfinals with a unanimous decision victory over Aman Purazgar, but there were defeats today for both Christian Preston and Jack Lawler, Keith. Have you got over the excitement of uh, England yet? I'm just about, just about, and I'm gearing myself back up for Saturday. I absolutely cannot wait. Do you fancy them? The more it goes on, the more I do. Do you? Yeah. They've, they've, that mental thing of getting over a penalty shootout, the mm. galvanising effect of everything that's gone on around them during this World Cup, they've gotten here without necessarily putting in a brilliant performance, yeah. and I think there probably is still a decent performance in them, mm. and I reckon that might come against Sweden. Yeah, it's going to be, I've got Kenny coming on soon. but um, He's going to love all that. I know. I was just wondering, was there as much excitement in the Cunningham household as there was in the ITV studio? Can we have uh, footballs coming home good to go, and yeah. all that kind of stuff for Kenny? I'm yeah, sure he'll appreciate it. Yeah. Could be a show. Vindaloo? Vindaloo, I think Kenny can be all over. Pete, get them up in the hockeys. <laughs> Cheers, Richie. It's time for the football show. The football show on Off The Ball. In association with the faster than ever Boyle Sports app for exclusive price enhancements on the biggest games around. Download it now. Boyle Sports. Time to play. I'm prepared to end it if I can. Well, do it then. Come again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? Oh, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should there be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Very welcome along to the football show, me Keith Andrews. We on the way we'll hear from Christophe Terreur who will assess Belgium's chances against Brazil on Friday night. We'll also catch up with my old teammate Damien Danani, who's just gone to Cork City. But before all that, we have to start with this. Chipier takes, referee see the push and get a penalty. Carlos Sanchez would not set Harry Kane free. Harry Kane is England's priceless gem! Him and him again! And England strike first! His boot is golden. Quadrado takes, and Mina scores! Colombia saves themselves at the last! Their carnival goes on! Eric Dyer places the ball on the spot. And England win on penalties! History in itself for this new team, new territory, the last eight of the World Cup, and who knows where beyond there. We've got Kenny Cunningham on the line, and Dan McDonald joins us from Russia. Even lads. Evening, Hi, lad. All right, Dan. Kenny, how much excitement was there in the Cunningham household last night? Uh, I'm mute enough, Keith. I wouldn't be getting wouldn't be getting overly excited. I, I've got to be honest with you. I was I was I was pleased England won. It's been really interesting watching them uh, during the competition. It's been a totally different type of England in terms of the uh, brand of football uh, that they've been playing. And although they haven't hit the heights maybe they would have wanted over the course of the 90 minutes in the games that they've played, they've shown enough during the the course of the tournament so far, Keith. To, to show that they're going to be a dangerous team, like going forward p- between now and the and the final, particularly uh, in terms of how the draws panned out, there's a real opportunity there for them. So I, I was pleased. I, I must admit, I was pleased they won last night. It's been very low key, Keith, over here in England. I've been in London predominantly during the tournament. It's been very low key since the start, and only really since the draw has kind of a. Uh, uh, panned out and kind of opened up for them. People have just been getting a little bit more, more excited at the possibility of England potentially reaching a, not only a World Cup semi-final but potentially even the final itself. And that's 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 a realistic ambition as as it stands. Dan, you were at the game last night. Paint the picture for us a little bit because it looked like a home game for Colombia for a lot of that yeah, day. I, yeah, and I, I have to say it really was, lads. And I, I, I suppose that was probably the impressive aspect of the England performance that... I mean, you, you lads know better than me, like, you know, the first 20, 25 minutes of the game, it was like an away international for England in some intimidating place. And they sort of took the, stung it, they took the sting out of the game a small bit. They, they kept the ball quite well. And, you know, Colombia didn't really try to play. And I, I have to say it was England were quite impressive. As much as they lost their way a small bit later on, like it was a genuinely... Um, Maybe not intimidating, but it was a, a not a very homely atmosphere from England's point of view. And it is sort of interesting listening to Kenny there talking about like the the lack of buzz in England. But the one the most striking thing I've found over here in Russia 
from covering like previous tournaments is how few England fans there actually is. Like, you know, there's, there's, I, I know we talk about the hype and the expectation about England teams during tournaments and for better or for worse, but, but genuinely over here, you know, in the stadiums, even the Panama game I was at too, they feel like the away side. And I don't know, in some strange way, is it working for them that they, they, they feel the pressure off? They don't feel like this stifling pressure, whereas it almost felt like Colombia last night got caught up in the moment and, and, and sort of abandoned whatever good things had actually brought them here maybe just because of the stifling pressure of the fans and the occasion, whereas England seemed to cope with the occasion very well. Kenny, Gareth Southgate rested a lot of players well publicised against Belgium, retreated to his favourite side. Was there any changes in there that surprised you or was it what you anticipated or would you change anything? No, I wouldn't, to be honest. There's only a couple of areas really key potential for the discussion, just in terms of Harry Kane's partner up front. Uh, uh, some argument in terms of Rashford getting the start ahead of Sterling, but it looks as if uh, Southgate has got confidence in Sterling. He hasn't hasn't been at his best, Sterling. He, he had some nice moments during the competition. Probably last night was typical of him. Got himself some great positions, some great movement, but decision making at times, Keith, even his touch at times, letting him down the ball, just getting him away from him a little bit. But Southgate's a big fan of him, just in terms of his just his energy levels, his key ability to drop off the front into deeper areas, kind of run the channels. He he's very direct. He goes at players. He draws players to him, which opens up spaces for other players and. I think a kind of feature of England's play, as uh, as the kind of one has been the ball retention, particularly in defensive areas. The pitch Dan mentioned it there, uh, the back three, how comfortably they are on the ball, how easy they can maintain possession and build attacks uh, from deep, but also the rotation high up the pitch. You know, Kane and Sterling are encouraged to drop off the centre half, drop deep into midfield. Invariably, that's the trigger for the likes of Lingard and Ali to break into the space in behind. And that's not easy enough from defending himself. That's, that kind of movement's not easy uh, to deal with. And that's kind of really been a feature of England's play. We haven't seen it over 90 minutes in every game. We've certainly saw in the first 20, 25 minutes of the Tunisia game, first game of the tournament, that kind of real kind of energy and dynamism and kind of good, uh, good rotation from England high up the pitch. And if they somehow tap into that, Keith, kind of going forward between now and the end of the competition, like I say, they're going to be very dangerous indeed. And they're going to have to score goals, Keith, because I'm still not convinced them defensively. They haven't really been tested that back three. And as good as they are in possession of football, I have my reservations. Kyle Walk for me, is not, not, not a good defender. Uh, Stones has his moments. And Harry McGuire, I think he's actually been outstanding. But if there is a small weakness to his game, it's just maybe in terms of... Uh, Get the ball down the side of him into the space in behind his ability to, you know, to turn and, and run back towards his own goal. So they haven't really been tested as of yet. So that'd be the one worry going forward. But a lot of positives, that said. Dan, you mentioned about the, the pressure, maybe that they're not feeling it. How, how big of an influence on that has been, has Gareth Selke been in terms of relieving that pressure? And, and have you been impressed with him in terms of how he's dealt with the press over there? Ah, oh, hugely impressive. It, it is, um, it's very striking that. You know, any, I mean, you think about it now, the last couple of weeks, England have been here. What sort of crisis has there been, right? There's been a small, you know, flare up around maybe resting some of the players for the Belgium game. And, and OK, I, I can see in the moment why that would have been the, the case. But I, it's funny, I spoke with Nathan last week that the fact that England was the last game, that by the time the, the game came around last night, you know, Argentina were gone, Portugal were gone. And uh, I think even some of the coverage in England was like, well, you know, Kane has outlasted Ronaldo and Messi. Well, they actually played in the same round, but it just happened to be the later game. But that's gone. But it, it does help that he, he can come out and he speaks very articulately. And OK, I mean, ultimately, it's all nonsense. I mean, it's about what you do on the pitch. But I, I think they have managed the, the, the mood around the camp very well. I think people relate to this team. I think people seem to quite like this team. And... OK, if they'd lost last night in penalties, having been in control for most of the game, then we would have been going through a brutal fallout today. So let's not sort of overstate that point. But I think it helps that he's someone that uh, seems very comfortable with the, the tournament pressure. He's not making bold claims. He's not saying things that are going to come back to hurt them. He's, he's, he's somehow managed to straddle that fine line that managers have, have struggled with before between being confident but also being sort of respectful and, and realistic about the situation. And I do think it matters whether you as sort of the, you know, the ex-players think 
that the, the press talk is relevant. I, I think it's it's good that he's he's somehow managed to to keep everything on an even keel, and there's been no drama around this campaign at all. I, I think I, Dan, so, Charlie, oh, I think the oh, most okay. impressive thing about Southgate really is the, like how he's set up his team tactically. Him and uh, uh, Steve Holland. You, you can talk about personally how he's kind of uh, carrying himself, the environment he's created, which I think is all kind of relevant. And Dan's touched upon it there, but for me, it's, it's the tactical set up the team was the most impre- impressive. He's uh, quite some time before the World Cup they, they decided on this system but it was the best uh, way forward for them and they've stuck with it and even in difficult moments in this competition the kind of Tunisia game the first game of the tournament have been the most obvious example they haven't changed they haven't deviated from it and you can see that they've actually done the work on the training pitch and how the team plays and the positions that the players take up they all have a clear understanding uh, of their roles in the team with the back three get the ball they know where the, the, next, uh, the next pass is coming from they almost invite teams onto them they play with real assurance and composure and possession of the ball and they're looking to work the ball even under pressure through the swords and, and up the pitch and, and that hasn't changed throughout the competition it was interesting watching Belgium uh, the other night who kind of who um, uh, you know, commit themselves to a kind of three-four-three system prior to the tournament, and when push came to the shove against Japan the, the other night, they they chucked it in. He went away from that. He changed the whole system, and it was probably the right thing to do. And the end, it got them back in, into the game. But uh, Southgate hasn't deviated, and it's a credit to him and his coach and staff that they actually bedded this system down uh, prior to the team coming to the World Cup. And they look very comfortable in the system. Everybody understands the role of the, the role in the team in possession, Keith, and our possession of the football. Kenny, I know you've been a big fan of, I'm sure, of what they've done set piece wise, scoring seven goals. All right, a few of them have been uh, penalty kicks from Harry Kane. But is it a worry? You've already mentioned it from open play. They've only scored two goals. When you look at some of the other big boys scoring a lot more freely, and, and in that area of the pitch where we presume we look at Sweden a little bit, but where they have to break teams down and they had the opportunities yesterday to go and get that killer second goal, couldn't make it. Would that worry you? Wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a massive worry, key to be honest with you, because I like what I'm saying. Uh, I mentioned, you mentioned about who potentially might come into the team. I, I'd love to see Danny Rose come in. I know he hasn't had a huge amount of game time, but he even showed me enough, Keith, when he came on the few minutes he was on the pitch the other night. You know, just that ability, just that little, you know, to link up and, and get beyond the defensive line. He played a great one too late on and whizzed the ball just uh, wide of the post. So I think the likes of him and Trippier, uh, what they can give you in forward areas of the pitch, you know, factor in the likes of Kane, his kind of quality, his link up play, Sterling and, you know, Ali Lingard lost his cheek, you could factor in even Rashford. I actually still think Keith, there's probably more to come from them in terms of their quality in the in the last tour of the pitch. And you're absolutely right. And I'm talking about kind of preparation, the tactical setup. Well, part of that, of course, is how well drilled they are in terms of set pieces and a lot of good uh, variation as well, Keith, uh, to their set pieces. The goal they scored, I think, was against Panama. The John Stone's goal free kick was brilliant when he laid into Kane. He flicked it around the corner. Maguire headed it back across the goal, really coordinated move. That was absolutely uh, brilliant. So, yeah, you are right. There's been a heavy leaning heavily on the uh, set pieces but, but again what do you think in, in open play there's a little bit more to come from them as well I don't think we've actually seen the very best of England uh, in the attacking sense we've seen in small periods and spasms but like I said if they can tap into that and we can see that little bit of quality for longer periods of the game then certainly Sweden, uh, Sweden and potentially Croatia and Russia in the semi-final are going to be up against it because as things stand I'd probably give England a slight advantage over all those teams in terms of the potential to qualify for a, for a World Cup final. Dan, we've seen Colombia at times getting quite fiery last night, England getting really tested out. How did you feel the benches dealt with it? Obviously, they only pan to it every now and again on the TV cameras. What, what were the benches like? Were they getting that quite animated? Well, uh, yeah, I think from the English side, they were pretty, they were pretty composed. I know that... Um, there was a period towards the end of the second half where naturally he made the changes that he needed to make. But in terms of the actual environment, it feels like, I don't know what your opinion was, but it felt like in the first period of extra time, England were a little bit rattled by what had happened. They'd had the concession. But I thought it was quite impressive that they managed to gather themselves a small bit. And they were probably the better team, maybe, for the second period of extra time. And and, and, and again, you know, they, they use, I think, you know, Kenny mentioned Danny Rose there. I think they probably used the, the new rules there as well quite well. They could make the four subs that they could make. Um, and they managed to calm things down. Maybe Dyer was having a difficult time. They could put him into the back three. 
Um, I, I was so disappointed by Colombia overall. I mean, they were completely wound up for the whole game, not just the, the bench, but even some of the technical staff that was actually quite near us. Um, I, I don't know. It, it was just they, the, the occasion got to them a small bit, and the English bench was actually a bit further away from us. The Colombians were slightly closer, but I mean, they seemed to sort of gather themselves and compose themselves in, in their circumstances. And like, I mean, I don't know. It was, it was a strange game. I found it unusual because I thought we might be talking about, you know, Colombia coming out to play, you know, some of the strengths that England have, you know, with the, the pace they have in the break would, would be able to capitalise on Colombia's ambition. And it was a completely different game. It was almost similar to Tunisia with England trying to break them down. Period Dan, of time, I think but, that James was. I know every so he's going to be a big yeah, of course, and play, but it course, was absolutely yeah. huge because Colombia just didn't have, have anybody in that central area the pitch that could link play up for them. When you look, yeah. when you looked at kind of England, Henderson to a certain extent, but kind of Lynn Gard and Ali dropping in there, and they, these are players who can kind of play in the half turn. They can play around the corner into Harry Kane's feet and kind of link up from there. When you looked at Colombia, they'd absolutely nothing. They had a, they felt the start for Falcao up front because invariably, by and large, it was just. A hopeful ball from back to front almost ironically traditionally how we're used to seeing England play when the pressure comes on them at previous tournaments you know uh, center half stepping forward kind of panicking and hitting balls kind of hopeless balls uh, hopeful balls back to front and that's what Falcao had to deal with for a large majority in the game probably the exception being the first half of extra time like you've suggested they looked a little bit uh, more uh, composed and got a little bit more penetration particularly down the left hand side of the pitch but it was England who were, who were the, more, the more composed and it prepared to receive the ball in those central midfield areas under a little bit of pressure and actually played through the pressure and that was probably one well it has been one of the most impressive aspects of uh, England's play Kenny how do you think the referee dealt with the occasion he was obviously tested for large parts of it wasn't he yeah not easy though Keith was it because like Dan has said there it was awful stuff from the mm. uh, Colombians too much I actually thought it's one of them I've seen teams, and we've probably all done ourselves a little bit, um, maybe against superior opposition, you think, right, we're going to have to spoil this a little bit. Yeah, or, yeah, so you allow yourself to get out of control a little bit, yeah, or it seems as if you're out of control, but at the same time, you're, you're, in con you're controlling the madness yourself. I know that's a bit of a paradox, but you're actually in control of what you're doing. You're, try you're trying to instigate a bit of madness, but you're actually in control of uh, uh, what you're doing internally. But I didn't think that, that was the case with the Columbians. I actually think it got to them as well. I don't think they helped themselves. And I think they disrupted their game more so than England. But I think it was a compliment to the English players. And they, you sense that early in the game. The opposition teams are not to those tactics. For me, it's an indication that they're scared here. They're in trouble. They know it. Deep down, they know they're in trouble here. Maybe they haven't got what it needs to get the best of us. So they need to disrupt it. They need to try and get a yellow card, instigate something in the game. But by and large, England didn't buy into it. Henderson, in that occasion, threw the head back ones, came dangerously close to taking the bait. But by and large, I think the English players sensed what was happening and they remained good, composed, kept their calm and got through it. Any time any time the camera panned, I'm sure you would have seen it as well. Any time it panned over to Selka, all he was trying to do was usher on, please be calm, keep the ball, stay away from him. So I thought he dealt with it quite well. Dan, when the penalties kicked in, it looked like it was going towards penalty, could you get a sense of any of the English feeling, bench, fans, because look, look, let's be honest, it's, been, it's a horrendous record they've got from penalty shootouts. Yeah, look, it, it was slightly strange when the stadium, to be honest, because there was such a Colombian feel about the whole thing. And we sort of touched on it there that, that within extra time, the mood changed, that actually England were on the, in the ascendancy for the, the last 10, 15 minutes or so. So to be, to be completely honest, even people around me, when it went to full-time whistle, when it went to extra time, there was that sense, or sorry, it went to penalties, sorry, there, there was that sense of trepidation. And even right up to Jordan Henderson sort of taking a couple of solos or whatever it was on the way up to his penalty kick, there was this sense of, oh, we've seen this story before. And the, 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 the whole mood in the stadium changed, I feel, with the Colombian miss, with the, with the penalty straight after mm -hmm. Henderson's miss, that... It was almost like this gave England this sense of belief of, oh, we've, we've got away with one here. And um, honestly, it, it's just so unusual because I'm so used to England being the dominant team in the games that they play. I think it's South Africa, even Brazil. It was like the home game feel for England. That, that England have just, within the stadium, no one was almost with them, with the exception of this pocket of fans behind the goal. But they, 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 they took something from that Colombian miss, the penalty off the bar, and I went from there. And now 
I don't know. It's it's a different story to what we're used to with England. Where it was it was the classic England meltdown if they gave away a game where they were the better team for so much of the game as as they were the most composed team, they were the calm team. If they'd thrown it away, I don't know how they would have got over it mm. because it would have been very hard to to maybe process what had happened. But now, hey, we're into we're into strange territory that it it is. I I totally agree with Kenny's assessment that. I mean, you look at Croatia as as the much they're a very good side struggling against Denmark. You know they they found it difficult. Like England are well capable of uh, of of getting this done in terms of getting to a final anyway. Kenny, how do you? Croatia have to find somehow find those energy levels because I couldn't believe what I was watching against Denmark. How kind of they just all the energy had just drained down and they were so one pace particularly that central midfield area which is key for Croatia kind of Modric and Rakitic if they don't function in that area of the pitch Croatia just don't function at all as a team because that's where their uh, their strength is and if they can somehow tap into that again and find that bit of dynamism to their play which which we've seen previously particularly from those two players and Brozovic probably another one in behind that well England will just run through them England will literally run run all over Croatia and if they can get at Lovren uh, and Vida in those central defensive positions, I mean, they're going to have them on toast. Now, I'm not saying that's the case. I expect uh, uh, Croatia to improve but if they can, if somehow there's no fuel in the tank, I don't think it's even a given that Croatia will get past uh, Russia in the quarter final. So, really before we get on, Kenny, before we get on to that, tell, tell me your thoughts on Sweden. So, they have been on an unbelievable journey, so hard to break down. I, I, I know for a fact, even without speaking to you, you would have been impressed with their team shape, their structure. We've already highlighted, for instance, for England, there might be a bit of a lack of creativity. There are similar, similar players playing in those areas where you look to get between lines. But have they got what it takes to break down that Swedish side? Kenny Gaunt. He's got no answer for you, Keith. You've, you've, you've flunked him with that question. <laughs> that was for you. Oh, that was for me. I was, I thought you were directing that to Dan. Excuse no, me. You, buddy. I thought you bowled his middle stump there. I didn't know what to do to answer you. Look, I think he, uh, uh, Keith, England can cause them problems. I've no doubt about that. Sweden won't make it easy. I'm a big fan, Keith, of how Sweden play. They've played this way for years. And in a funny way, I think they're a little bit more efficient with uh, Ibrahimovic out of the team. Mm. You know, the two banks are forward, the front two, nice and compact. You know, they press a high at times. If not, they'll drop into a deep defensive shape. But very difficult to find those little kind of pockets uh, that you were talking about uh, on the inside. You know, the work rate's that good. And again, we're talking about a team being prepared, Keith, uh, in terms of their system of play, understanding what's required of them, uh, and being really disciplined in what they're doing. So I don't think you'll see the match stuff from there as we saw with Colombia, that kind of lack of ill discipline. I think they'll be very focused, very disciplined uh, in, in what they do. And it won't be easy or right for England to break them down, but I still think England have those players who can provide that, that those, those moments uh, magic we've mentioned before already they have them on the bench as well England uh, I don't see too many of them in, in Swedish jerseys Berg and Toivon uh, up front you know hard working but I would, wouldn't be worried by them Forsberg is the obvious is, is the obvious one but apart from that I'm really struggling it's really the collective uh, with Sweden which is their strength and it's a great strength because like I said I enjoy I enjoy watching the play how they set up the play but I still I still feel, feel if England can match those kind of en- energy levels and, and the focus and the, and the concentration is right from England and it has been so far I still feel over the course of the 90 minutes the quality Eng- England have and those kind of central and forward areas of the pitch I, I, I still feel as if England will find a way through Dan have you managed to get to see Sweden at all over there what, what's your thoughts been on them I, ha- I haven't seen Sweden but I actually did speak to someone today who was around the Swedish camp and just to get a sense of what the, the feel was there and th- they're pretty confident I have to say I mean they, they have a a reasonable record against England in recent times. I know that can be, you know, the relevance of that can be debated. But, I mean, this is a group that sort of must have an incredible mental strength and must have this great belief that they've already effectively knocked out Holland and then beaten Italy over two legs to get here. I think they feel in Sweden that they're not getting as much credit as they should for their defensive strength in terms of, the chances that they, they haven't given away in the tournament. And I actually think, um, I think you mentioned Marcus Berg there. I think, again, stats can be taken whatever way you want it, but I think he's got like the most shots on target in the tournament or the most shots in the tournament without scoring a goal. I think he's got 13 efforts. 
So they actually feel that there might actually be a bit more in the tank. So I think they're actually quite happy with this role that they've got. They're they're pretty accustomed to it. They've they've been written off, I guess, at various stages in the way, you know, in, in the campaign to get to this point. And and I completely agree with Kenny's assessment. Whatever about Colombia who lost the plot completely, like Sweden will will do what they do. And they seem to have a manager in, in Jana Anderson who's entire reputation i think he won the league with like norcopping a very small team in sweden his whole reputation seems to be about taking a team that is greater than the sum of the parts and doing great things with it and i think if all the focus this week is very much on england and and england's strength and what will england do to sweden i think they're going to be quite happy with it maybe they will be found out maybe that this this is the natural point where they are caught out but I, i don't expect them to be you know to freeze on the occasion because Going away to Italy, you know, all these little tests that they faced, they generally have handled them quite well. And I think for England, it's it's a tough opponent because it is actually shifting that expectation right into their court completely. Kenny, Gareth Southgate will have to obviously look at the troops over the next couple of days, see how much that game is taken out of them physically. But assuming everybody's in and around fit, would you change anything? Because I'm looking at it, and I've already mentioned about the way Sweden play. We know they're going to play in that deep 4-4-2. For me, the space is out wide if you can get into those areas. I think you've already mentioned Sterling playing narrow, playing centre. I'm with, I don't think it suits him playing in that position. Certainly in an England shirt, he looks more comfortable in a Man City shirt playing in those areas. I think it's crying out for him to tweak it and play a 3-4-3 and get a little bit more width into that team. No, I don't think so, Keith. I, th- I think if there's any change, it'll purely be personnel. I don't see any change in the in the formation uh, whatsoever. It's a shame, really, because the formation's actually heard Rashford, and we're, we're both huge fans mm. of Rashford. But the only way Rashford can play in this team is really up alongside Harry Kane as one of those kind of central strikers. You know, he can't play wide as a wing back. He can't play as one of those midfield three. If he was playing kind of an, if you were playing an orthodox 4-3-3, setting up England as a 4-3-3, you could argue for Rashford playing off either flank or even playing as a 10 in behind uh, Harry Kane. And he probably actually would make the team. But... With this England team, the system really is, is uh, absolutely key in terms of kind of the three-five-two, that kind of V-shaped in midfield, and those two number eights, those two attack-minded number eights. It's uh, it's Lingard and Ali at the moment. Lost his cheek has come in and and play there as well. For me, they're they're the absolute key. There was some talk before the tournament that maybe flipping to an orthodox midfield two, Dora and Henderson, a little bit more defence-minded, and just play with it and just play with one in behind the front two. But he hasn't. He's kind of stuck with those two number eight it's the bolder ploy Keith but I, I think it suits him I think it suits the team I think they're comfortable with it and like those changes that are going to be made it's just in those areas for me really I think Danny Rose you've talked about a little bit of penetration down the side if they're not having a lot of joy down the middle where Sweden are going to uh, make, not park the bus but uh, flood that area of the pitch well then you want to see plenty of kind of good combination play down the sides and not only that wing backs with the ability to have to beat the opposite man in 1v1 situations Ashley Young for me generally can't do that he generally throws a shape checks back and plays sideways or puts an early cross into the box Danny Rose has got the ability to actually drop his shoulder and go past somebody at speed and take the ball to the ball line and put a uh, uh, good delivery in from there so that be for me would be the temptation Danny Rose and potentially Marcus Rashford is it going to happen I don't think so Ashley Young picked up a slight knock the other night if he's not fully recovered I think Danny Rose will play but probably for me Sterling to play alongside Harry Kane as well <coughs> But I'd be reasonably happy with that if I was an England, an England fan because I think the balance of the team is good uh, and it won't be easy against uh, Sweden. It really won't. But I think England now are showing a little bit of mental toughness and resolve, which we haven't done previously, which they, have, they haven't done previously, I should imagine. And it's going to serve them well and they'll definitely need it against this very kind of resilient Swedes, uh, Swedish team. Lovely. Lads, listen, thank you very much. Thanks for taking your time. Dan, join Moscow. Thanks, Keith. I just left Kevin Kilban with some of his celebrity friends tonight. So he's, Go on, uh, name names. You, I, I don't want to name them, but I, I reckon if you got Kevin Kilban on the show now, he could become like some kind of viral sensation. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's Dan, fully enjoying... Dan, could you, bring a, could you bring a provisional... Could we get your provisional passport for Kev sent over to you? Is that, can he get out of the country? Is he stuck over there? What's the latest? I, I, 
I think he's got like a migration stamp on his wrist just in case he gets into a bit of bother. But uh, he's, he's, he's enjoying the joys of Moscow tonight with some of BBC. Lot, lot of stories going around how he lost our passport, Dan. You know, it's probably not right What's for your us, take you on know, it, Ken? Tittle tattle, but can you confirm uh, or deny any of those stories that our passport was lost? <laughs> Well, it, for some reason, he referred me to his legal team when I actually brought, brought it up, so I'm not sure what's going on. Yeah. Lads, take it easy. Cheers, yeah. Keith. Cheers, Dan. <laughs> uh, all right, we've had a couple of text tweets in. Um, one from Owen McHale. Uh, on what is Kenny basing the comment about England being more likely to go through than Sweden, Croatia or Russia? Croatian midfield will destroy them. I think Kenny made a valid point, though, about they did go missing, fatigue, tire, whatever way you want to put it, because they are absolutely crucial to the way Croatia play. Another one here is more than England in the World Cup, lads, are going home. Swedish Anto. Lads, was in a pub in Dunmore, County Galway, match, watching the match and the cheers when the Columbia goal went in was unbelievable. Should we not be supporting our near neighbours? Well, I was, I have to be honest. I'm not quite sure I want them to win it though. England have been terrible. Average at best, seriously, cop on. They played one decent team and lost. Think about it, Tony. I will, I will have a think about that. Cheers, Tony. Right, fair play to them. They won a shootout, but Kane fell to defend the first of the penalty and that's why they went mental, Jim. Um, right, we're going to move on now. We're going to chat Belgium. Joining us on the phone is Belgium football journalist Christophe Tour. Christophe, thanks for joining us. After the break, I'm going to them. Sorry, lads. The Taoiseach's comments at some kind of lunch in New York in relation to finding common ground with Donald J. Trump in relation to us, the awful media. Has he found genuine common ground with the, the leader of the free world? I mean, well, I, mean, I wouldn't take that um, too seriously. From what I understand, the Taoiseach was having a lighthearted discussion with a group of young people and these quotes have been taken out of context. Hear the full News Talk Breakfast podcast at Newstalk.com and on the News Talk app. The Big Grill, Europe's biggest barbecue bash, is back in Herbert Park, August 16th to 19th. A smoking hot weekend of barbecue, cocktails, music and fun, with demos, masterclasses and tastings from top Irish and international chefs, pitmasters and restaurants, all cooked over fire. Over 30 craft breweries, Jameson Feast, Schweppes 1783 Gin Experience, Just Eat Waiter Service and the hugely popular Hot Wing and Chili Eating Challenges. Kids area on Saturday and Sunday and under 12s go free. Tickets at Big Grill Festival. Com. Enjoy alcohol responsibly. Go forth, adventurer. Down empty back roads that narrow and wind. Tackle mud and bumps, obstacles of any kind. Power through this rain-soaked, windswept drive. Have a great day, Sean. The wildest adventures around Ireland don't come close to the school run. Go anywhere with Land Rover. With the Discovery Sport and Range Rover of Oak available from €39,000. Book your test drive today at LandRover.ie. Land Rover. Above and beyond. Delivery and related charges apply. Are you interested in qualifying to treat pain and injury? The National Training Centre offers part-time evening and weekend courses directed by internationally renowned expert John Sharkey. Enroll now for courses starting nationwide this autumn. For details and availability, visit ntc.ie. NTC. See who you can be. Off the ball. This is News Talk. Welcome back. We are now joined by Belgian football journalist Christophe Tour. Christophe, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Hi, guys. How are we? Christophe, dramatic victory um, against Japan the other night. Is, uh, has, has the country got over that? Yeah, it must be, it must be a huge sense of relief. Yeah, it was a sense of a release. A huge enjoyment. I see the images and the footage of what happened in the country. Amazing scenes after that brilliant uh, winning goal. I must say, we struggled for 60 minutes. Uh, Belgium were not good. We saw all the weaknesses of this team. But in the end, they were mentally strong and they uh, they got it. And I think this, this victory might have given them a boost to confidence wise to go for the first real test in uh, what is it in four years to play Brazil now Christoph so. t- tell me a little bit about what you, what you think and what the general opinion is of, of those weaknesses that you've mentioned Vulner- we, we are vulnerable at the back um, we play pretty attacking football with two wing backs uh, who like to run forward, uh, Carrasco is not even a wing back, he's a, he's, a, he's a left forward, so, and if they both go up together, 
your defense gets gets exposed, your midfield gets overrun, and that was an issue in uh, in some of the friendly games too. But because we've always played weaker opposition and not a disciplined team like Japan, it has never been exposed like it was now. And I think Roberto Martinez might change a few things for the Brazil game, not changing his system because he will stick to that system because he has, does, doesn't have players to play with forward and back. That's what he thinks, unless he has found something in the training session. But maybe he might put on another defensive midfielder and push the Piran a little bit forward. But we'll have to see that. They haven't trained on it yet, so we'll have to see what they're doing. Christoph, in the first few games, I mentioned the absence of Vincent Company wouldn't allow Belgium to go far in this uh, tournament because, in my opinion, Derek Boyata is nowhere near those levels. I, you know, I must confess, him coming back into the team, I felt that would have shored up those defensive issues that, that you would have had concerns about. Would, would the Belgian fans feel that or do they still not think it's enough? Yeah, well, he, was, he, he was not good against Japan company, to be fair. He wasn't... But it's always he needs a first game. His mm. second might be better. So I think he might be up for it to, uh, after tomorrow. To, to it's always been better. He can he can control things. He's a leader. He has experience. But still, you need to be protected too by defensive midfield and by your wing backs. Um, but anyway, against Brazil, we can lean back a bit more. We don't have to go out full attack either. So we'll have to see how that works out. But I think there will be more defensive security against Brazil also because Ma uh, Martinez will build in a little bit more security. Eden Hazard has been quite prolific under Roberto Martinez. I think it's 18 games he's played with Martinez, 10 goals, 8 assists, 9 assists even. What, what's the general feeling of, of how he's done in this tournament? He, the first game, he wasn't that good. I think he started with too, many pre too much pressure on his shoulder. I saw his face before the game and I know he was stressed. Uh, in his second game, he was, uh, he was brilliant. Um, against Japan, he showed some, some sparks, but he wasn't there the whole game. But not... not any Belgian was good in the game against Japan. Up the level wasn't always well. Hazard was good in the, in the better in the second half, not up to his best level. But all those guys are now looking forward to that Brazil game and to finally show how good they are. So, and he might he will get space against Brazil mm. too from their wing backs. So he might shine too. He loves space and he loves to play against his uh, best friend William. Uh, we'll have to see what that gives them uh, on Friday. There's a lot being made, Christoph, about the relationship between Eden Hazard and Kevin De Bruyne, the possibility of maybe De Bruyne not playing in passes. Are, are we reading too much into this? We, we have had that discussion in Belgium four years ago and everyone is reading too much in it because they get along well. Eat. So we we'll have to. Just having a little trouble there with Christoph's line. Apparently, he's in the Brazilian team hotel in Sochi. Uh, just Neymar just walked past him before he came in the line. But going to take a quick ad break, and then joining us will be Damon Delaney. Off the ball on News Talk. At Expo Dalexica, we're always bringing you the latest appliances and technologies. For this week only, we're giving you a free five-year warranty with selected Electrolux washing machines and dryers. Only available through our 67 stores nationwide. There's an expert near you. Find yours at expert.ie. Terms and conditions apply. So many cars look the same. Do you want to drive a car that looks different? A car that feels different? All Mazdas are designed with the Japanese philosophy of Jimba Atai, making them the perfect harmony of driver and car. And right now, you can avail of incredible offers across the range, like a €4,000 summer bonus. Visit your local Mazda retailer and experience the difference. Mazda. Drive together. Terms and conditions apply. 
Yeah, he was in the doghouse all night. Yeah? Well, no, he was in the car. Oh. Yeah, ran our battery down, listened to the radio like. What? Wouldn't start the next morning. The radio? No, the car. So first she throws him out. Of the house? No, the car. And then she rings post insurance breakdown assist. For the... Well, for what else? For the car. Life's unpredictable. Don't worry, we get it. Post insurance car policies come with breakdown assistance you can rely on. Call us on 1890 222222 for a car insurance quote today. Post insurance. Expect more. Acceptance criteria, terms and conditions apply. One Direct Ireland Limited trading as Post Insurance is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. One Direct Ireland Limited is a wholly owned subsidiary of Unpost. Off the ball. This this is News Talk. Welcome back. Joining us on the line now is my old teammate, Damon Delaney. Thanks for joining us, Damon. No worries, Keith. So, 2000s, you left, you made your way to Leicester City and 18 years <laughs> later, you're back. <laughs> At Cork City. Tell us a little bit how that came about. Yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes I look back now and I wonder why did I do it? Like, you look <laughs> at some of the, the things you went through, but um, it was a great journey and uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, but I'm really happy to be back at Cork City now. Tell, tell us how it came about. Was it a, was it a phone call from um, John Caulfield or were you back on holidays, back, back seeing no, family? No, like, I mean, I was, you know, obviously I knew John from, I was only uh, in the youth team in Cork City coming through and John was obviously finishing up his playing career. Um, and you know, listen, you know, when he got the job, we, you know, periodically would text him, you know, like before a big game or if, if they won a, you know, after they won the league last year and stuff. And we just, you know, stayed in touch through text really. And um, and then he phoned me, um, kind of maybe back in the last season. He asked me would I be interested. And I just said, look, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet. Um, wasn't sure if I was going to keep playing or. Um, I just wanted the season to finish and just everything to calm down really and then make a, a clear decision. Um, and then uh, after a week off, I went out to Spain for a week and then you know, after long discussions with, um, with my partner, um, we decided it was uh, in everyone's interest to move home and uh, Tom was delighted. Good stuff. Listen, you made your first start last night against Portsmouth. How, how were the legs? How did you feel? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Um, you know, I didn't play a lot. Um, I didn't play a lot last year. I think my last start was in the FA Cup in January. Um, and you know, you know as well that you know you could do as much running as you want, or go in the gym as often as you want, and even train as much as you want. But not in comparison, actually, you know, going out on the pitch and playing. Um, and the only way to get match fit is, is obviously to play matches. So it was good for me to get uh, 60 minutes in, in the legs, uh, a little bit. A little bit ropey, uh, a couple of moments here or there where I was questioning what I was doing, but they are kind of things you need to get out of your system, and uh, it had to be done. And I'm just looking forward to um, to cracking on, really. So, how how have you found it being back? I know you've you're a massive Cork City fan, and you would have been watching like like most of us with admiration of what John Caulfield and, and that yeah. squad of players have done over the last few years. How has it been since you've gone back? It's been brilliant. Uh, it really has. Um, I think if you're I always, I always believe that if you're, if you're happy in your environment, um, you know, and you're happy with your job and you're happy with your life off the pitch, you know, you, you will enjoy it. And um, moving home has been been brilliant. Uh, my girlfriend's really, really happy here uh, at the moment. Uh, training's brilliant. Um, John is John. You know, he lives and, and breathes it. You know, um, he really, really, really is uh, into it. And, and I like that. You know, it's the type of manager I like playing for. Um, so obviously, knowing him, how he is. Yeah, that was obviously a big draw as well for me. Well, you you mentioned there about being happy, and I certainly took a couple of moves in my career that I don't think I should have. One mm. financial was it wasn't the right move for me, and for, certainly mm. for my career. We would be played together at Hull City. I was in a good place in my career. I could have quite easily have given up football at that time. I really mm. didn't enjoy it. When I went went to Ipswich on loan, you were there, obviously a part of the furniture at Ipswich. I played there for a few <laughs> years. I think I don't want to put words into your mouth, but you certainly were, weren't happy at that no. stage of your career there, were you? No, not really. I just, you know, um, for whatever reason, I just I wasn't enjoying uh, my football. I wasn't enjoying you know, my life off the pitch. And I think all of it just kind of, I don't know whether one was causing the other or the other was causing whatever, you know. Um, but I just wasn't happy. Um, and then I went to Crystal Palace and uh, found a home there, and, and for some reason it just really clicked, and I just got into got into it. Um, but I think your personal life is is really important. You know, if your life is in in turmoil, then you're definitely not going to be um, not going to be able to play at your best week in week out. I mean, you can mask it over and cover over it for a few games, or even you know a few weeks or maybe a month or so. But eventually, it gets you. You know, when you're looking for the consistency that you need, you know, to play at that level week in week out. 
Could you have imagined when you did join Crystal Palace what you would have went on to achieve with that club, going yeah. up, promotion, <laughs> staying in the Premier League, playing in that solid base and, and really excelling? Yeah, definitely not. I mean, I only signed a, a three-month contract when I went there. Um, I think it was on deadline there just before the end of August or, or early September. Um, and I just took a three-month contract, really, because... Um, well, I don't really know why, if I've been honest with you. It was just a stroke of good fortune. Um, and I really enjoyed it. You know, when I walked in, I mean, you know, you know, people like Aaron Wilbraham and that, you know, who's um, who was there and big characters. And there was a few other people there as well. Peter Ramage and Danny Gabidon and people, you know, that I just thought, good guys. And they were good teammates and they were really, really good people. And they just kind of had a good fit, really. Um, and then the club just took off. Uh, and I was lucky that I was able to be a part of it for so long. So... Dundalk last week obviously went mm. a couple of points ahead of you. Um, mm. Twelve games left. What what's mm. the feeling within the camp at the moment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, John hammers home that message, you know, that we're here to win the league, and, and that's what he expects. And I think it's the right message as well. Uh, of course, they're you know defending champions, um, and I want to come in and I want to 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 be the league champion again this year. That's my aim. That's all the other players' aim is. You know, there wasn't a lot in the game. Um, you know, even at one one, Carl Shepherd hit the post. Um, you, know, you can say that Dundalk were were had more possession or had had more chances or whatever. But the best chance of the game felt to Carl Shepherd really. You know, at the end, um, and if Coxie go two and up there, it might be a different game. So there's not a lot between the two sides, um, and you got twelve cup finals coming up now, and um, really, really looking forward to it. I've I've been, I've only been back properly over the last eighteen months or so, Damon, and I have to hold my hands up. I I've been amazed by the standards of the League of Ireland, the professionalism of what mm. they do on such little budget. Mm. Um, has it impressed you? Yeah, definitely. And I think John as well is um, is, um, is is really keen to, to, to raise the standards of Cork City. And when I come in, I see they're trying to do everything that a professional team should do. It's obviously the scale and the, the level, you know, which finances dictate, but they're still trying to do it, you know, in terms of getting your food before and after training and the training surface uh, being being adequate or being good enough, really. Um, travel, um, just going to hotels in the afternoon before games, everything's there, you know, um, and it really has impressed me. Um, and the players as well. I mean, the players are so, the, the, the Cork City bunch are so honest. It's really refreshing, you know, to come into a changing room where you just see 20 lads that are really, really, you know, geared up to, to train as hard as they possibly can every day. And I mean that because John works the lads, you know, even my first few days I was coming in, I was thinking, jeez, a lot of training that they like this in a while, you know. Um, John doesn't seem to give free kicks in training either, so it's pretty much a free for all. <laughs> so um, but that's brilliant, you know, I really enjoy that and uh, it's been a bit of fresh air for me, really, um, especially with the environment that I, I've come from, you know. It's, it's difficult. We would have played with players down through the years where we think this fella doesn't care. He's getting played X mm. amount a week. Mm. He, he tosses off training. He doesn't turn mm. up for training. He, he hides in games and all that. So mm. it must be quite refreshing to go from. I'm not, I'm not saying Crystal Palace was like that mm. at all because far from mm. it. But down through your, you must have witnessed that. And now you've yeah. gone into this type of environment. It can only invigorate you, surely. Yeah, of course it can. I mean, look, you, you were a Blackburn as well. And and, and you know it's like in the Premier League, it's you know it's it's it's, it's, it's different. You know there's different characters, different nationalities, different everything. And some people are at different stages in their career. Some people are in the Premier League at certain clubs for whatever reason. But to come into Cork City and know that every player is really really geared up to win the league and win the cup. You know because many will say, well, Cork City want to do the double again this year. And then we come in every day. It shows in everything they do from the warm up right through the session and then into the games as well. You've mentioned the league, you've mentioned the cup, retaining it, all the rest. Of it. You haven't even mentioned the Champions League yet. How exciting <laughs> is it to be maybe playing it in the Champions League and you're nearly on your 37th birthday? Yeah, it's brilliant, really, for me. Um, you know, to, to, get, to get a crack at a team like um, like Warsaw, I'm really, really looking forward to it now. Um, you know, obviously they're a very, very good side, um, and everyone uh, came out and said that Leisure Warsaw are a fantastic side. But you know, I'd look at that and I'd say, well. They're still in the first round of qualifiers of the Champions League. Um, they are obviously a good side, but they can't be that superior to us with with them coming in at the same level as us. Um, and I think I don't know. I haven't seen enough of Leisure Warsaw, but when I look at the way Cox City play and the effort and the, ter- the determination and the spirit that they have, um, I've got no fear that we will give them a good run, um, and hopefully we can get a, a result against them and progress. 
Have you seen much of the World Cup? Who's impressed you? you did you get to see England um, last night? Yeah, I did, to be honest. Yeah, if I mean, honestly, Keith, I'm struggling to get into it. Have you really? Uh, yeah, honestly. Uh, and I know people are probably going, um, you know, you're mad. It's pretty, man, the whining, the play acting, <laughs> um, all that carry on. You know, it's just getting on my Cork nerves. City, is that? Like, honestly, genuinely, Keith, it really is. <laughs> and I know people are probably going, but last night, that, that, that when England got the penalty, it was about four and a half minutes. The referee just stood there and just holding court with five or six Colombians, and I couldn't, I couldn't understand. Yeah, but I, I know for a fact if you'd have been out there wearing a Colombian short, you would have been into that ref non-stop. Yeah, and trying for to about delay. thirty seconds to plead my case, but like, <laughs> and on top of that as well, those Colombian players must know that there's VAR, and he's looked at it and he stood by his decision. But sooner or later, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but sometimes I, just, I find myself getting frustrated watching it. People going down, trying to get other players booked, other players sent off, wasting time. Yes, it's professional, um, but it's not enjoyable to watch, if I'm being honest with you. But maybe I'm in the minority there. Have, have you, um, do you think England have a chance of winning it? Um, uh, I don't think so, no. I think they'll probably get to the semi-finals, definitely. Um, but I don't think they're going to win it, no. I has don't the, think they're good enough. Has there been a sense of watching Serbia and Denmark and thinking <laughs> what could have been? <laughs> I don't know I've been thinking that. <laughs> you know, not just Serbia, Denmark. You look at like uh, Russia are in there as well, and and Sweden and, and teams like that. You know, and, and they would all probably be in and around, you know, kind of where we're at really um, as a nation. So yeah, definitely. You know, if they can get that far, you definitely have to wonder why. You know, there's a possibility that maybe we one day could get that far as well. So come on then, give us a winner. Who do you think is going to go and win it? Um, I think uh, France are going to go and win it. Got, got um, Uruguay in the semi-finals. Yeah. Uh, sorry, in the quarter-finals and then yeah. Brazil, Belgium to go past. So you go on that side, you go on France. I think I'll go France because uh, I just saw today somewhere at Cavani struggling uh, and I think he's such a big part of what Uruguay do um, and if he doesn't play then I think um, I think France will progress fairly handily really. I could see you playing in that Uruguay team to be fair. Love it, Keith. Absolutely love it. <laughs> uh, he's um, the way they set up. You're right. I think if Annie, if he's missing, yeah. they're gonna struggle because Suarez, I don't think is is absolutely on. I think he's slightly overweight, not, yeah. not fully, fully sharp. Yeah. Um, but defensively, the way they work, the way they're drilled, and you'd have to throw Sweden into that equation as well. And I think mm. I think that's been a refreshing part of this tournament that teams that can be just organised and not have outstanding yeah. talents like Sweden can still show what's capable just once you're you, you, you need an outlet shoot. you know when you're defending uh, in that number in that many numbers and that deep and that narrow and that compact you need an outlet you know you can't just sit there for 90 minutes and do nothing I think Cavani's a, a big part of, of their outlet you know and, and Suarez as well I know he's not set the world on fire but he's still a, a threat you know and Sweden have got some good outlets too you know because you do have to relieve the pressure at some point and you know to, to win a game you do have to go and score a goal and, and these teams are are very, very good at getting up the pitch and scoring goals, be it set plays like certain teams, or be it, you know, counter attacking, or be it um, just breaking away and scoring a goal. Damo, listen, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate And I hope it goes well at Cork, pal. Brilliant, Keith. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, hey, buddy. Thanks, man. Bye bye. I was Damo, good um, pal of mine. Very good golfer, by the way. I forgot to mention that. I'm going to, to, to play him in golf very, very soon. Um, right, so tomorrow we've got Off The Ball AM is live at 7.45. Get on to YouTube.com, Off The Ball, Facebook.com forward slash Off The Ball, or follow us on Twitter and you'll be able to watch it all. Then it's World Cup Daily with Owen Sheen. That's live from 12. Again, find it all on our social channels. We're live tomorrow night from Ballyliffin again, set from 7 with Nathan and Joe on a jolly up, up and dunny goal. The Dubai Duty Free Irish Open and John Giles will join Richie on the football show from nine. Tom Dunn is up next. We'll chat tomorrow. Take it easy.